Uh, welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is The Heart. So before we begin discussing the heart, we need to have some definitions about the vessels that take blood to and from the heart. Because a lot of people are under the misconception that arteries always carry oxygenated blood. And while that's true in the systemic circuit, it's not true in the pulmonary circuit. Because arteries, by definition, carry blood away from the heart. And deoxygenated blood has to be carried away from the heart as well to get to the lungs where we can have gas exchange. So we're going to go with the, the appropriate definitions and say that an artery is a blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart. All right, so then there also has to be a blood vessel that carries blood back to the heart, and that is a vein. So again, in the systemic circuit, where we find most of our veins, veins are carrying deoxygenated blood. But in the pulmonary circuit, after gas exchange has happened in the lungs, that oxygenated blood is now going to return to the heart in pulmonary veins. So veins carry blood back to the heart, Or they just carry blood to the heart. And we're going to put those definitions in our pocket and start talking about the heart. What do we need to know about the heart? Well, today we're going to talk about anatomy, and next time we'll talk about physiology. So, first let's talk about these two circuits that I mentioned. So, the right side of the heart is the side of the heart that is receiving deoxygenated blood and pumping it out to the lungs for gas exchange. We call that the pulmonary circuit. So the right side pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs. This is part of the, uh, or this is what's called the pulmonary circuit. So the right side pumps blood through the pulmonary circuit. And then the systemic circuit is going to be the circuit that pumps blood out to the body or the system. And that's controlled or pumped uh, by the left side of the heart. So the left side of the pu heart pumps oxygenated blood to the whole system. in the systemic circuit. So the right side is pumping our deoxygenated blood to the pulmonary circuit, and the left side is pumping our oxygenated blood to the systemic circuit. So think about that. If the right side has to just pump out to the lungs, and the left side has to pump out to the entire body, which side of the heart is doing more work? The left side. So we'll see that you can actually see that anatomically. The left um, ventricular myocardium is thicker because the left side of the heart has so far to pump. So, okay, just be aware of that. And then the other thing about this sidedness, then, is that the heart is a side-by-side -side pump. So blood is pumping through both sides of the heart at the same time. It's pumping through the pulmonary circuit just at the same time it's pumping through the systemic circuit. So be aware of that. If you were to see a question or something that asked you, true or false, blood pumps through the pulmonary circuit before it pumps through the systemic circuit. The answer would be false. Blood is pumping through both circuits at the same time. Now in a moment you'll see, we talk about the pathway of blood through the heart, and we'll see by convention we start in one place. So, and that's in the right atrium. So sure, if we're following one blood cell through the heart, by convention it's going, you know, in a particular way, um, through the pulmonary circuit first, and then through the systemic circuit, but it also just kind of depends if you're following one cell, you could start anywhere. So just be aware of that. Blood is pumping through both sides of the heart at the same time. So I've got this little model here. This is the left side of the heart, which is pumping blood out to the systemic circuit. 
and the right side of the heart, which is pumping blood out to the pulmonary circuit. So we'll talk more about each of those systems in a moment. Okay, so our pulmonary system and circuits then. Let's talk about this and how do they relate to the heart and what are our chambers and what's going on here. So the two superior chambers are called atria. You have a right and a left atrium and these are going to receive blood from either the pulmonary or systemic circuit and most of that is going to be passive and then they're going to squeeze a little bit and uh, pump the rest of the blood through the pumping chambers, the inferior chambers, the ventricles, which have the big job of pumping blood out of the circuits. So our receiving chambers are called atria and so we've got a right and a left atrium. And then our pumping chambers are our ventricles. So again, we've got a right and a left ventricle. Now I'm just going to leave these up here uh, so that we can talk about some different things that we have. In here, this little region that you don't really see uh, on models because the great vessels are blocking it is the inner atrial septum. And the inter between atria, interatrial septum, is just the tissue that you find separating the right atrium from the left atrium. Because we need the right and the left side of the heart to be totally separate from each other. This side is just conducting oxygenated blood. This side is just conducting deoxygenated blood. So we want to make sure that we're not mixing that. Okay, and then our pumping chambers, our right and left ventricles, are separated by a big thick region you can and it's going to be important, it's called the interventricular septum. And I'll show you that. The interventricular septum contains part of what's called the heart's conduction system. And that is going to conduct uh, impulses through the heart. So we'll talk about that next class. But if you see right here, these are our ventricles. And so between our ventricles, we have our interventricular septum. And we can see a couple things uh, here. In the interventricular septum, this is called the interventricular sulcus, and it contains your anterior interventricular artery. This vein that's the companion vessel here is the great cardiac vein. So we'll talk more about all of that, but just while we're looking at it, we might as well see it. So again, you can't really see, if we look up here, this is my uh, left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. You can't really see the interatrial septum in the model, but it's in there. You can see the interventricular septum. And this little, these little, um, this little white space here contains, uh, this would be our left bundle branches and our right bundle branches. And so we'll talk about those more in a moment that lead into these Purkinje fibers or what's part of the subendocardial conducting network. All of these cells are um, going to be conducting action potentials that will help the myocardiocytes to contract. So we'll talk about that more next time. All right, so that's what we see separating all of our chambers. And um, what else do we want to say? That our atria are receiving chambers. They're receiving blood from the um, pulmonary and systemic circuits. And the ventricles are pumping chambers. They're pumping out to those two circuits. I don't really want to erase this yet, but I have a question for you. So just listen, and you can read past the writing. The pulmonary trunk receives blood from the right ventricle and conducts it toward the lungs. The pulmonary trunk is a, or an, A, artery, B, vein, C, capillary, D, none of the above. Here, I'll show it to you. This is the pulmonary trunk. So what is it? It receives blood from the right ventricle and conducts it toward the lung. So the key about this question is that it's conducting it toward the lung or away from the heart, which means it's an artery. So even though it's blue because it has the 
deoxygenated blood, it's an artery because it's conducting that blood away from the heart and to the lungs. Okay. <clears throat> I kind of just still want to keep this picture up here. So let's go ahead and talk about it. The size, location, and orientation of the heart. I'm glad I have you here, Alex. I wasn't even thinking about using Alex for this, but I'm going to do it. So um, if we look here, your heart is located between your lungs, and it's kind of oriented. Well, it's not kind of oriented like in a sided manner. It is sided in that it pokes anteriorly and inferiorly into the left lung. So your left lung is sided. It has this region here you can see called the cardiac notch. And that's to accommodate the heart sticking into it. So you can see that here. This is the cardiac notch of the left lung. And this is the heart. The right lung has an extra lobe and it doesn't have a cardiac notch because there's no heart sticking into it. So as far as that goes, your heart's right here and it's surrounded that covers it. Does anybody remember the name of that? It's your pericardium. And the pericardium is unique among serous membranes because it has three layers as opposed to two. Most serous membranes have two layers. The inner layer that's in contact with the organ is called the visceral layer. And the outer layer that's in contact with the wall of the cavity is the parietal layer. Well, the parietal pericardium is unique because it has an outer fibrous layer that anchors it here in the thorax. And then the visceral um, and like inner serous layer, inner serous parietal pericardium are normal, and so they sit and allow for the reduction of friction as your heart continuously beats. So those are in there. And then as you can see right here, these are called the great vessels of the heart. So they are surrounded in mediastinum, and the mediastinum surrounds the pericardium. So the mediastinum, if you recall from way back at the beginning of MP1, the mediastinum is the membranous partition we find here between our lungs and our heart. So it's between our pleural membranes and it's surrounding our pericardium and it's just helping to reduce all the friction uh, between the organs right there. So that's it. This is the apex of the heart. You can feel an apical impulse between the ribs. This is the base of the heart up here, up toward where the great vessels are exiting. So that is what I'm missing from a picture that I'm not copyright infringing on. If you've been wondering, where did all the pictures go? And why is she not putting them up? Mm, because I believe in following laws mostly, and copyright infringement is definitely something that I don't want to do. So, all right, here you go. Let's see what else. Okay. I am going to have to erase. Darn it all right, Tech. No, I'm not. I'm coming back. Why? Because I want to just talk to you about some things that we find in here while we're looking at the relationship of these um, chambers to each other. Because we still just have to look at anatomy for today. There's a lot of anatomy to look at for the heart. So, what we said we had four chambers. Our right atrium, left atrium, our right ventricle, and left ventricle. So the thing about the heart is that it's continuously pumping blood. And the way that it pumps blood is from superior, and then we start like inferior back to like superior. Look at this. We're receiving blood here in the atria. It's going into the ventricles, but then our great vessels are up here. So how are we gonna get that blood from the ventricles up and out of the heart? Well, we're going to contract our atria, then we're going to conduct this impulse down through here, but insulate it so it doesn't cause the muscle cells to contract. And then down here, we'll stop insulating it so that we can start contracting from the apex up toward the base and push the blood out. Well, if that's happening, when my ventricles are contracting, what is preventing them from pushing that blood back up into the atria? Well, it's these things called atrioventricular valves, and this is why I wanted to keep this picture up, because we still have some things that we need to talk about between all of these chambers. And right here in this model, you can see this is an AV valve, atrioventricular valve. Um, over here, we've got another atrio, atrioventricular valve. This one on the right side, 
has one, two, three cusps. And this one on the left side only has one, two cusps. So this one is called the tricuspid valve, and this one is called the bicuspid valve. If you close this cusp, this thing looks like one of those Catholic priests or pope, no, not the pope, maybe. I think bishop or priest, I don't know. It's called a mitre or something. So they also call this the mitral valve. And so uh, that is what we find um, here between our atria and our ventricles. And these are gonna prevent the backflow of blood from the ventricles to the atria when the ventricles begin contracting down here. Now, when the ventricles relax, then what's gonna stop the blood from going back from these great vessels then into the ventricles? And it's a different kind of valve called semilunar valve. So here we can see the pulmonary, pulmonary semilunar valve. And back up here you can see the aortic semilunar valve. Okay, so I'm gonna write all of those things in here. So those are our four chambers. So what are some other things to be aware of? Okay, we said that the was the serous membrane that surrounds the heart and it is unique because it has this third layer. This third layer is what's called the fibrous pericardium and this is uh, fibrous connective tissue that anchors the rest of the pericardium in the thorax. Pericardium in the thorax. And that's because your heart is continuously beating. And it's able to continuously beat and you don't have to feel it because of the serous pericardium, which is normal. It's like just a normal serous membrane. It's got an outer parietal layer and an inner visceral layer. Does anybody remember what those are made of? Simple squamous epithelial tissue. So our serous pericardium has two layers. The outer parietal layer, and our parietal layer is uh, what's in contact with the fibrous pericardium. And then it's going to turn around and um, become the visceral layer. And so each of these is a single layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue. All right, well, there's also this space in between here. This is called the pericardial cavity, and it's full of pericardial fluid. So pericardial cavity with pericardial fluid, and that's just the serous fluid that functions to reduce the friction as your heart continuously beats. So what does this look like? Because it can be hard to like wrap your head around what the relationship of this is. And so let's just draw out all of our layers. So we're gonna draw out first, the covering of the heart is the pericardium. Uh, and then, then we've got the heart wall. So I'm gonna draw a layer of the heart wall in red. This is the thickest layer of the heart wall. And we're not talking about that yet. <laughs> so we'll talk about it in a minute. On top of that is this visceral layer of our pericardium. So we call this the visceral pericardium. Um, but it's also, when we're looking at layers of the heart wall, it's also called the epicardium. So that's kind of weird. So the visceral layer or the visceral pericardium is your epicardium. And I'm going to draw that right here. So if we look, hugging the tightly to the myocardium is the epicardium. Epi means upon. And that is the visceral layer of our serous pericardium. At the base of the heart, the parietal pericardium turns around on itself to give rise to that. What the heck did you just say, Janessa? Well, I said these words. Look, here's how I'm going to draw another layer right here. This is my parietal serous pericardium. 
It's simple squamous epithelial tissue. It turns around on itself at the base of the heart to become the visceral pericardium, which hugs the layer, the outer layer of the heart wall. It is the outer layer of the heart wall. It hugs the wall tightly. So what we have in purple then is like this one tightly hugging here with little stars is the visceral pericardium. And then this one out here with little smiley faces is the parietal pericardium. Okay, see that? In between there, we've got the pericardial cavity, which is full of pericardial fluid. Now the first time I taught this class, I taught it in the summer, and I had a student who had pericarditis. And that's a condition where you basically can feel every heartbeat because you don't have, you're not secreting appropriate amounts of, amounts of serous fluid in there. There's inflammation in your pericardium, in your serous pericardium. And so she said it, like, it was excruciating. It was like, felt like tearing and ripping in her chest because she could feel every heartbeat. So this cavity here being full of pericardial fluid is super, super important. And I guess um, you don't, once that happens, you don't like have to feel every heartbeat for the rest of your life. You can have um, just like bouts of pericarditis and the more you have them, the more likely you are to have more. And I guess whenever she was having one of these bouts, she would have to like sleep in a chair. If she laid down, it was like excruciating. I can't even imagine. So this is super, super important um, to functioning of an organ that has to continuously move, then we really need to make sure that there's no friction. Okay, so that's our serous pericardium. What about this fibrous pericardium, this outer layer? That is this fibrous connective tissue that is attached to our parietal pericardium and anchors the pericardium to the thorax and surrounding structures. Cool. Layers of the heart wall. So layers of the heart wall. Epicardium. Hmm. Hmm. Do we have epicardium? We sure do. It's the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So it's our visceral pericardium. And it's simple squamous epithelial tissue. So we'll go ahead and write it, and we'll write it in purple to think, keep things consistent. Epicardium is our uh, simple squamous epithelial tissue, and it is the visceral pericardium. Okay, the thickest layer of the heart wall is where we find our cardiac muscle. So who remembers anything about cardiac muscle from last semester? Hopefully all of you. We said that it was striated, which means it's going to use the sarcomere as its unit for contraction. We said that it was multinucleate, it could have one to three nuclei. We said that it's involuntary, uh, and it is made of these cells that are called myocardiocytes, or cardiomyocytes, or cardiac muscle. So this will say it contains our contractile cells. It also contains our other cells, but they're part of a conduction system we'll talk about. The bulk of it is formed. So we'll say the bulk, the bulk is these contractile cells. And it contains uh, these contractile cells that, um, this is, we could say it's our thickest layer. What else do we want to say about it? Mm, these contractile cells have lots of names. We could call them myocardiocytes. We could call them cardiomyocytes. We could call them contractile cells. Um, cardiac muscle cells, yada, yada, yada. So this layer, when these muscle cells contract, they push blood. So our contraction moves blood. And so it's our thickest layer up here. It actually also has something 
something else. It's called the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And if you look in your book, there should be a picture that shows kind of the way our myocardiocytes like swirl around in this beautiful arrangement through the atria, kind of looks like the infinity sign, and then down through the, um, and up around and through the ventricles, it's beautiful. And so in the myocardium, we find this fibrous connective tissue that forms the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And what it is is this nice kind of internal framework that organizes and holds our cells together. Another thing that it does, it gives some structure. Another thing that it does is, is it's going to insulate this conduction system. Because the other types of cells that we have are going to be conducting action potentials. They're um, the autorhythmic cells that set the pace for the heart. We don't want them to start stimulating the contraction of our myocardiocytes when they're passing through this interventricular septum. We want all of those cells to be insulated as they pass through here, and then not insulated when we get down here so that we can stimulate contraction from the apex upward. So all of this insulation is also coming from that fibrous skeleton. So if you were asked something like the following are functions of the fibrous skeleton of the heart. A, to give structure to the heart. B, to insulate the uh, heart's conduction system. C, to offer support. D, all of the above. The answer would be all of the above. So it's offering support and structure for all those myocardiocytes, kind of organizing them around, and then it's also insulating our conduction system so that our impulses are sent appropriately throughout our heart tissue. So, okay, let's say for myocardium, it also contains the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And this gives structure, um, structural organization to our myocardiocytes, and it insulates the conduction system. Which will make more sense in a little bit. All right. The innermost layer, or within endo, the heart, cardium, is a simple squamous epithelial layer as well, called the endocardium. So lining the chambers of the heart, this innermost layer is endocardium. And it's simple squamous epithelial tissue. That was supposed to be a different color. My apologies. So in here, we've got simple squamous epithelial tissue. So we could say, and it is continuous, it's simple squamous epithelium, it lines the chambers, lines the walls of the chambers, and it is continuous with the endothelium of blood vessels. Okay, endocardium, simple squamous epithelial tissue, lines the chambers, and continuous with the endothelium of those blood vessels, which we will talk about when we get to blood vessels. Okay, questions? Ah! <laughs> if you have them, ask in discussion. All right, so if you remember in the brain, the shallow dips between our gyri were called sulci. So you have dips in your heart, sulci, and in those dips, we find the coronary vessels that are uh, responsible for bringing oxygenated blood to the heart and taking deoxygenated blood away. So right here, we can see, it's really easy to see the dip. That's why I got this model um, of the heart to show you. This sulcus between our atria and our ventricles is the coronary sulcus. So you can see the coronary sulcus passes around here between the atria and the ventricles.
Okay, and then here, this is the anterior interventricular sulcus. Back here is the posterior interventricular sulcus. So those are the sulci. Uh, so other surface features you need to be able to recognize. Well, our atria, these are the receiving chambers. And most of the time when you're sitting around, you know, just relaxing, they receive a set amount of blood. But sometimes if you're exercising or something and you're squeezing extra hard on your muscles, you're gonna push all that blood in your veins uh, extra fast back to your heart. And so you have to receive a little more blood. So there are these enlarged regions on the atria called auricles, and they just kind of give the atria a little extra volume to accommodate increased venous return. So those are some things you can see there. Um, if you were to come up to the lab practical station in your living room or wherever your computer is and see like this marked, that would be the left auricle. Now this seven here is just showing you the left atrium. So this is the right auricle here. This is my right atrium. All right, awesome. Ventricles, what can we see on the surface of our ventricles? Well, not a whole lot. Those interventri, the, the sulci, the anterior and posterior interventricular sep, um, sulci, you can see, what else? I don't know, let's just continue. Let's just continue. Ah, here, here's a good question for you. Is it good or is it just a question? That's always the question. Uh, on the external surface of the heart, the atria are separated from the ventricles by A, the anterior interventricular sulcus, B, the posterior interventricular sulcus, C, the coronary sulcus, D, all of the above. The answer is C, the coronary sulcus. So this is what separates the atria from the ventricles. The ventricles are separated from each other, you could say, on the external surface, you could see the anterior and posterior interventricular sulci. are these beautiful valves that separate your uh, atria from your ventricles. And over here you can see this is the tricuspid. And over on the left you can see the bicuspid. So, okay, those are our AV valves. So let's talk about this. On the right side of our heart, between our right atrium, and our right ventricle, we have what's called the tricuspid valve. So our atrial ventricular valves. We could say these are the AV valves. And they are going to prevent backflow of the blood from the ventricle to the atrium when our ventricles are contracting. So our AV valves prevent backflow to the atrium. our right atrium and our right ventricle. Uh, on the left side, we have our left atrium, which is separated from our left ventricle by the bicuspid valve, which is also called the mitral valve. And so in a moment, we're going to talk about the pathway of blood through the heart. And we'll see by convention, we start here in the right atrium. So then we'll go through the right side, the pulmonary circuit, to the left side, and through the systemic circuit. So if you're trying to remember which side of the heart has which valve, then you can remember you should try before you buy. So the tricuspid is on the right side, the bicuspid is on the left side, and they are preventing backflow of the blood from our ventricles to the atrium when our ventricles are contracting. 
backing. Okay, the other valves under here are the semilunar valves. So the semilunar valves are the valves that we find between the ventricles and the great arteries leaving the heart. So our semilunar valves, we've got two, the one between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. So we'll just imagine from the right, right ventricle, blood's going to go up and out the pulmonary trunk. It's semilunar valve is called the pulmonary semilunar valve. Or the pulmonic valve I've seen sometimes. And so the semilunar valves are going to prevent backflow from our great arteries to the ventricles when the ventricles relax. Okay, and on the right side, the semilunar valve is the pulmonary semilunar valve. And on the left which passes behind and curves around. And so its semilunar valve is the aortic semilunar valve. So the pulmonary semilunar valve prevents backflow of blood from the pulmonary trunk to the right ventricle, and the aortic semilunar valve prevents backflow of blood from the aorta to the left ventricle. So all of our valves are preventing backflow of blood Tricuspid prevents backflow from right ventricle to the right atrium. I'm putting it back here now. It would be here, in between here, is our tricuspid. And then we pump out through the pulmonary semilunar valve, which then prevents backflow from the pulmonary trunk to the right ventricle. On the left side, we have our, from our left atrium, between our left atrium and our left ventricle, we have the bicuspid, which prevents backflow from, or prevents backflow of blood from the ventricle to the atrium when our ventricles are contracting. We push our aortic semilunar valve open, push blood out, and then the aortic semilunar valve prevents backflow to the left ventricle when our ventricles relax. Okay. Awesome. So, those are our valves. What about this blood flow through the heart I was talking about? How does blood flow through the heart? And this is where people can get messed up on that true-false question I asked you earlier. So, blood flows through both chambers, or both sides at the same time. It is flowing through pulmonary and systemic circuits at the same time. You can't just stop one circuit. So true or false, blood flows through the pulmonary circuit before it flows through the systemic circuit. False. Now, we're going to talk about the pathway of blood through the heart. And by convention, we start in the right atrium, which is the beginning of the pulmonary circuit. So if I were to ask you true or false, by convention, one blood cell flowing through the heart goes through the pulmonary circuit before going through the systemic circuit, then the answer is true. One blood cell would do that. But we're talking about all the blood when I ask a question like that. However, if I'm saying, okay, what's the pathway that blood flows through the heart starting with one blood cell? Then by convention on the right side, we start where we return our deoxygenated blood to the right atrium. And it's receiving deoxygenated blood from our superior structures through what's called the superior vena cava. It's receiving blood from the inferior structures through the inferior vena cava. It's receiving blood from the coronary circuit through this thing called the coronary sinus. So your heart has to continuously beat, so it needs a never-ending supply of blood. We're going to talk about the coronary vessels in a minute. All of our coronary veins are going to drain into this enlarged region on the posterior side of the heart called the coronary sinus. So that is also returning deoxygenated blood to the heart. It's just that that deoxygenated blood is coming from the heart. So that's the coronary sinus. This is the superior vena cava. This is the inferior vena cava. And all three of those structures are going to empty into the right atrium, which is the beginning of our uh, pathway of blood through the heart. 
So our, our right atrium is receiving blood from the superior vena cava, which I'm going to now on, uh, abbreviate SBC, is receiving blood from the inferior vena cava, which I'm just going to abbreviate right now is IBC, because you can write inferior, and I have vena cava spelled up there. So it's receiving blood from the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, and then also from the coronary sinus. Okay? So all of that deoxygenated blood is going to enter our right atrium. It is going to pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So we go through our tricuspid into the right ventricle. And then from our right ventricle, I'm going to go pump up. So I went from my right, my superior and inferior vena cava and coronary sinus into my right atrium, which went through my tricuspid valve into my right ventricle, which is now going to pump up out through my pulmonary semilunar valve into my pulmonary trunk. Okay, so then my pulmonary trunk is going to immediately branch into my right and left pulmonary arteries. So, my, I go into my right ventricle, I go through my pulmonary semilunar valve, into my pulmonary trunk. My pulmonary trunk is going to kind of come up, and then that is going to immediately branch into my right and left pulmonary arteries. Our arteries do what? Take blood away from the heart. Where is this blood going? To my right and left lungs. So I'm going to my lungs. This is where I'll have gas exchange. We'll talk more about blood vessels like next week and talk about all the details of this. For now, we'll say that we're going through our pulmonary semilunar valve, into the pulmonary trunk, and out to the lungs. Then in the lungs, we're going to pick up oxygen, and then all of that oxygenated blood is going to empty back into pulmonary veins. And my right and left pulmonary veins are going to empty into my left atrium, which is then going to pump through my systemic circuit. But we're not there yet, because we're going to be talking about the right side of the heart. Okay, so the right side of the heart. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus, in the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, to the right ventricle, through the pulmonary semilunar valve, to the pulmonary trunk, to our pulmonary arteries, to our lungs, and then we're going to have oxygen exchange. So So now we're going to pick up oxygen and empty into, so now I'm oxygenated blood that's going to enter into pulmonary veins. So my pulmonary veins are like the last part of my pulmonary circuit. So see here how this is like the last part of my systemic circuit that empties into my pulmonary circuit? This is the last part of my pulmonary circuit that's going to empty into my systemic circuit. So the pulmonary circuit starts at the right atrium and ends at the pulmonary veins. Okay? Pulmonary veins then are going to bring blood to the left side of the heart. So let's draw this out. So the left atrium is going to receive blood from my right and left pulmonary veins. This is oxygenated blood now that's going to be pumped out to the systemic circuit. So here are my right and left pulmonary veins that empty into my left atrium. Now I'm going to go through my bicuspid valve into my left ventricle. And it's hard to see on the model. I'll show you on dissection. You can see that the left ventricular myocardium is thicker because it's got a lot farther to pump. It has to pump to the whole systemic circuit so it works harder than the right uh, ventricular myocardium does. So make sure you're looking for that in your dissection lab. Uh, okay, so our left atrium is going to then receive our blood from our pulmonary veins. It's going to go through our tri uh, our bicuspid valve into the left ventricle, which is now going to pump up and out our aorta. So the aorta, you can see, is back here behind the pulmonary.
pulmonary trunk. So our aortic semilunar valve is kind of uh, back here behind, there it is, the um, atrioventricular valve behind the bicuspid valve. You can see that's my aortic semilunar valve. So I'll go from my left ventricle up and out my aortic semilunar valve to my aorta. This first part of my aorta is the ascending aorta. The coronary circuit branches off of that. We're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, and then this is the aortic arch that is going to lead into the descending aorta. And then all of our branch and major arteries are coming off of all of that. So we'll talk about that when we get to blood vessels. But I just wanted to show you that now. We are about to talk about the coronary circuit. And you can see then that the coronary circuit is coming right here off of the aorta and going to serve the heart. Okay, so we go out to the aorta and out to the system. When we get out there for our arterial, we get out to the capillaries, have nutrient and gas exchange, empty into veins. And uh, so if we have nutrient and gas exchange, now we're gonna have our deoxygenated blood that's gonna empty into veins. And then all these veins are gonna empty into either the superior vena cava, vena cava the inferior vena cava, or the coronary sinus which is going to empty back into the right side of the heart and start over again. Okay? So that is blood flow through the heart. Okay, so the coronary circulation. One of the things about blood vessels is they can actually vary quite considerably from one human being to the next. So when we learn blood vessels, we're only going to learn the ones that everybody has all the time, everywhere that we name the same. So why does that happen? Well, because it can be kind of easy for some of your smaller blood vessels to get blocked off, plugged up with all those McDonald's french fries you ate. And um, so if that's the case, then you need to be able to grow new blood vessels to go around it. So you'll see, if you look at like a detailed picture of the coronary circuit, there's a lot of stuff. We're only gonna memorize a couple things, and we're only gonna memorize like three really um, veins, coronary veins, and then we'll we're, we are gonna uh, memorize more arteries than that, but it's really not a whole lot that we're gonna talk about. Um, but I just wanna bring that up to you kind of now, so that if you're looking at some book and you see some really weird, obscure thing in the heart, it's because, well, that's how it is. And so, uh, what is the function of the coronary circulation? It functions to supply the heart with a never-ending supply of nutrient and oxygen-rich blood. So the heart has to continuously beat. So we don't want to ever have to go, we don't ever use aerobic respiration. We're always going to use aerobic respiration. We don't want to build up lactic acid or anything like that. So in order to be able to continuously beat and use aerobic respiration, we need a continuous supply of oxygen-rich blood. So the coronary circulation, and that's its function, is that it's going to supply the myocardium, or well, it supplies the whole heart, uh, but really there's thickest layers of myocardium. So it supplies the heart with a continuous supply of glucose and oxygen. And the coronary arteries that we're going to look at are coming off of the aorta, and we have to memorize the left coronary artery. And it's going to come off the aorta and pretty much immediately branch into the anterior interventricular artery, which serves the left ventricular myocardium, which is pumping out of the circuit. So you get a block in that and myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack and you're out real quick. So this is the anterior interventricular artery. It resides in the anterior interventricular sulcus. Its companion vessel is the great cardiac vein. We'll talk about that in a minute. So that's the anterior interventricular artery. The other branch of the left coronary artery that's going to reside here in the coronary sulcus is the circumflex artery. And the circumflex artery is going to wrap around the left side of the heart in the coronary sul sulcus. So this is the circumflex artery. And it's going to 
to go around the posterior aspect of the heart. So we can see that right here. Here's my aorta. And branching off of the aorta, I have the, whoa, whoa. Branching off of the aorta, I have the left coronary artery that branches into the circumflex artery and the anterior interventricular artery. I need to be using my incense pointer, not this marker. Okay. All right, so then on the right side, you can see it's a lot easier to see the right coronary artery coming off the aorta. You can see this right here is the right coronary artery, and it's going to branch around in the coronary sulcus and continue to the posterior aspect of the heart. And then here, right here, is the right marginal artery. So that you need to know. So the right coronary artery is gonna branch into the right marginal artery, and then it's gonna continue around and branch into the posterior interventricular artery. So my right coronary artery, which is also coming off of my aorta, is going to continue around in the coronary sulcus, branch down into the right marginal artery in the front, and then it continues around the posterior aspect of the heart to give rise to the posterior interventricular artery. So the branches of my right coronary artery, which runs around the right side of the heart in the coronary sulcus, are the right marginal artery in the uh, kind of on the lateral aspect. And in the back, when we wrap around the posterior aspect of the heart, the last branch of the right um, coronary artery is the posterior interventricular artery. So what are those? So again, here we go, arteries. This is my aorta. That is going to branch into my left coronary artery. That is going to branch into my circumflex artery that runs around in the coronary sulcus and my anterior interventricular artery which runs in my anterior interventricular sulcus. And then here's my aorta, which is going to give rise to my right coronary artery. It's gonna run around the heart in my coronary sulcus. It branches into my right marginal artery and my posterior interventricular artery. So those are the arteries that you need to know. And then we're only gonna really know three veins and then the coronary sinus. And so these are the companion vessels Veins and arteries are companion vessels, and our coronary veins that you need to worry about, we've already met one running here with the anterior interventricular arteries. So arteries and veins are companion vessels, and veins have a lot more variability than arteries do, so we're really only gonna worry about three cardiac veins. The great cardiac vein that runs here in the anterior interventricular sulcus with the anterior ventricular artery, the middle cardiac vein that runs here in the posterior, posterior interventricular sulcus with the posterior interventricular artery, and then the small cardiac vein, which runs here with the right marginal artery. So for our coronary veins, here running with the anterior interventricular artery, we have the great cardiac vein, The companion vessel running with the right marginal artery is the small cardiac vein. And then running around in the back and our companion vessel with our posterior interventricular artery is our middle cardiac vein. And that is our coronary circuit or coronary circulation. Okay, the last thing to worry about as far as heart anatomy goes is the microanatomy. And if you recall from last semester, we said we had three types of, skeletal, of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle is the only thing that's voluntary. It was striated and we had muscle fibers that were definitely multi-nucleate. We said we had cardiac muscle that was involuntary, striated, could have one to three nuclei, uh, and had these myocardiocytes that were little brain. 
branching things. And then he had smooth muscle, which was single nucleate and also involuntary, all that stuff. So this is the time when you're going to look at all of those muscle tissues. Now when you look at cardiac muscle cells, you can really see those striations. And it's pretty cool, but another thing that you can see is that our cardiac muscle cells are joined by intercalated discs. And those are those specialized um, structures that we talked about when we talked about cell junctions that have a gap junction and a desmosome. And if you recall, our gap junctions are pores between cells that allow one cell to the next, and desmosomes are snaps that kind of physically snap cells together. So the intercalated disc is this specialized junction that's both a chemical or electrical junction and a physical junction. So the gap junction part will say electrically connects our myocardiocytes. And the desmosome physically connects our myocardiocytes. And that's because we want all of the myocardiocytes in our atria to contract at the same time and relax at the same time. And we want all of the myocardiocytes in our ventricles to contract at the same time and relax at the same time. So we do that by electrically connecting them with those gap junctions and then keeping them physically held together despite these contractile changes because of those desmosomes. So that's the specialized thing about microanatomy that you see. And if you look at slides, a lot of times what you'll see is like uh, branching. So you'd see what, what's easy to recognize is the striations, these banding that you would see, and what's kind of weird to see is these little intercalated discs. It's just very barely darker. And so I wish that you were all here with me or the lab assistant in your lab, but alas, you cannot be. This is my intercalated disc that is gonna be the way that I physically and electrically connect my myocardiocytes. That's the important thing to be aware of. Microscopically, you can see that. You can also see striations. And what those striations mean is that our sarcomere is our unit of contraction. And why does that matter? Well, because uh, it's going to tell us that we need cal calcium for one thing. So, okay. I think that the last thing I want to leave you with is a thought about the two types of cells that we're going to have. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, I'll ask you a question, then I'll leave you with a thought. So, okay, which layer are layers of the heart wall contains cardiac muscle cells? A, the endocardium, B, the myocardium, C, the pericardium, D, all of the above. Which layer of the heart wall contains cardiac muscle cells? The myocardium, that's the answer. Okay, so this actually kind of works. This is where we'll pick up next time. Um, but uh, skeletal and cardiac muscle are kind of similar. And that's because they are using the sarcomere as a unit of contraction. So that means we have to have calcium, which is going to bind troponin, move the tropomyosin complex. Myosin is going to reach up on grab actin, have crossword cycling happen. So that's a similarity, which means that they're both going to need intracellular calcium to increase somehow. Uh, and that's going to be an importance. Um, so let's just go ahead and do this. They both uh, use sarcomeres. So they both require high intracellular calcium at some point. So we've got to be able to get the calcium inside the sarcoplasm or uh, in some like eat pretty easily. So both require uh, an increase in intracellular calcium. Um, what else? They both require energy. They're both going to generate tension, generate force. There's not a ton of similarities. Mostly we have differences. So some differences. Our skeletal muscle is stimulated by neurons. Our cardiac muscle sets its own pace. 
behaves. What? Oh yeah. This is why I kind of want to wrap up here because I want you to think about the anatomy and anatomical structures you already know. You already know skeletal muscle. Now read about cardiac muscle contraction and see where it's similar and see where it's different. So one of the differences that, we're, you know, that you should recognize and see is that the action potential that's stimulating cardiac muscle contraction, uh, so going along the cell membrane, is going to have a plateau. Why is that important? Well, we'll talk about it next time, but look at it while you're studying. So, okay, well, there's an action potential. We know what that looks like, you know. Well, we're going to have this uh, increase in our membrane potential, and then we're going to repolarize, depolarize, repolarize. Well, there's going to be a difference. So in skeletal muscle, our, our action potential that's going to initiate the action potential in our skeletal muscle is coming from a neuron. In cardiac muscle, the impulse that's going to stimulate our myocardial sites to contract is going to come from our nodal cells or our autorhythmic cells. So they have many names that we'll talk about next time. So these are going to set the pace. So we'll see that our cardiac muscle cells behave a little bit like skeletal muscle cells. Our nodal cells behave a little bit like um, neurons, so we'll talk more about them next time. But as far as the skeletal versus cardiac muscles go, what else? Uh, a difference. Our skeletal muscles are going to be depolarized only due to sodium. Uh, these guys are going to be depolarized due to sodium, um, but then we're going to have a plateau in that depolarization, and this is due to calcium. Interesting. Okay, so we'll get a plateau in the action potential in our cardiac muscle. Uh, what else? Our skeletal muscle is able to build tetany, or generate force and become constant, right? And then it either stops when you get fatigued or when you stop sending the, the signal. So you're able to generate tetanic contractions in skeletal muscle. So you can generate tetanic contractions. Now let's think about this. Would we want to develop tetanic contractions, constant force, in cardiac muscle? No! We, because then we couldn't pump blood. If all you did was generate force, then you become no good as a blood pumper. We need to be able to contract and then relax. So this delayed kind of depolarizing phase keeps the voltage gated sodium channel inactive so that we can have a really long absolute refractory period, which means that we're gonna be able to repolarize and relax. So you cannot develop tetanic contraction in cardiac muscle. Cannot develop tetanic contractions. And I'll just tell you for your back pocket, this is due to a really long absolute refractory period. Okay, uh, what else? No difference. Skeletal muscle moves bones. Cardiac muscle moves blood. Skeletal muscle found attached to the skeleton. Cardiac muscle found on the wall of the heart. Um, So just think about it. Uh, recall, I, I just, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what channels they have right now and just think about it and think about how it's all going to relate. We've got voltage normal, what I'm going to call right now fast, voltage gated sodium channels. What happens when these are normal? So what happens when they open? Sodium rushes into the cell and depolarizes into positive 30 millivolts. Okay, what else about them? They've got slow voltage gated calcium channel. That's what's going to cause this plateau. This calcium in here is going to also help with our cross bridge cycling. Uh, and then the other type of channel that we have is just a normal voltage gated potassium channel. This is going to be the channel that repolarizes us. So be aware of that. The arresting membrane potential is negative 90 millivolts. That was a similarity. Skeletal muscle also sits at negative 90 millivolts. Skeletal muscle does not have slow voltage gated calcium channels in its sarcolemma. Um, all right, so think about those channels, think about what they do, and we'll pick up next time to talk about cardiac physiology. Thanks for being here. <laughs> teacher can't stop being a teacher. Teacher will teach. Okay. <laughs>